How many of you were here last night? Praise God. Those that were not here, I would encourage you to get the recording. You will need all of them to really benefit from this weekend. <clears throat> I'm going to say again what I said last night. It may seem a little rough. Take what you think it's appropriate for you and what you feel that the Holy Spirit is saying to you and what you don't like, it's okay with me. You don't need to like me or to invite me back. That's 100% okay. But if you feel that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, you must act on it. Okay? Before we start, let's again bow our heads for prayer. Father, in humbleness, again we pray that you speak through your spirit and that you transform through your spirit our hearts. Father, please, bring results that human mind cannot grasp. May it all be for your glory in Jesus' merits. Amen. <clears throat> Let's start the presentation. I don't know exactly if it's there yet, not yet. You need a few seconds? Okay, we give you a few prophetic seconds. For probably, so in the morning we have two more sermons on revival. In the afternoon, we will have two on prayer. And I'm going to try to bring the most important points on prayer, crowd them together in those two hours. And the good news is that we will have time for questions and answers. Will you feel free to ask? Because I feel free to answer or not, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's start without the presentation until they are ready with the presentation. The title is One with God's Purpose. I have a question for you. Do you know why you exist? Cannot be that you exist to work and you work to eat and you eat to work and so on. It must be a purpose. What is the purpose that God called you to existence and God called the church to existence? Because it would be a tragedy to be alive, live life, and not know the purpose that God has for you and never fulfill that purpose. You follow me? Oh, by the way, again, if I go too fast, what are you supposed to do? Wave, and I'm going to slow down, hopefully. Okay, so it would be a tragedy. Oh, we got the power. Thank you. It would be a tragedy to be alive, go through life, and fail to know the reason you are alive and the plan that God has for you. So God called Israel, if you remember. God called Israel for a very clear purpose. But Israel failed to fulfill that purpose. And the Bible says that it made God, literally quotes, mad. Wow. God called them to be, Exodus 19, verse 6, a kingdom of priests. The same Bible verse, copy and paste, kind of, it's in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 9. You remember? God called us to be a kingdom of? Now, is he talking about the pastor or about you? About everybody. Doesn't matter the age, training. I don't care if you are healthy or sick, educated or not. Really, doesn't matter. God called you all to be a kingdom of priests. And if we don't do that, we will fail just like Israel. We are called to be a light, to be a force of attraction to the world. That means to be God's people. So let's go into the presentation. Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests. Spiritual Israel is called to be a kingdom of priests. They were called to be a force of attraction to the world, to save. So what does the Bible say? As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was how? angry God was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart 
they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. Be aware, brethren. Now, is he talking to Israel or to whom? I don't think he's talking to Moses. Moses was not there anymore when Paul writes this. Be aware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. As he said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Okay? <clears throat> Let's move on a little. Okay. <clears throat> they did not enter because of what? It says there, the last sentence. They did not enter because of unbelief. I want you to remember that. We'll go through four lessons. How many? Four lessons that we just read in this Bible verse that would show what we should do to actually be the people of God, to actually experience revival. It connects very well with what we did last night. It actually follows up. What happened? Okay. Hopefully it's good. <clears throat> Lesson number one. Oh, come on. It doesn't move. Okay. It just moved too much now. Okay. Finally. This remote. I don't know if it sees that. Okay. Now it works. Four lessons. I want you to read them with me. Is that possible? Just to make sure that you follow. Procrastinate versus urgency. Called out versus love for Egypt. Unbelief versus faith. And then wilderness. Wilderness versus eternity. So, four lessons. Let's go through them quick. We need to pray for the healing of the remote. <laughs> Procrastinate versus urgency. It says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden. But within those a few verses, three times says today, in the Hebrew culture, when it's repeated three times, Babylon is fallen, 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 or holy, holy, holy. When it's repeated three times in Hebrew culture, in their mind, it means it's important. It's crucial. You must listen. Why would God say today? What does it mean today? Today means what? Now. Okay. Why today and not tomorrow? I mean, tomorrow is not bad either. Today is Saturday, the 25th. Tomorrow is 26th. Not a big difference. Why today? Because we don't know what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. When I was a kid, I was not a kid. I was in the seventh grade. I was walking to school with my to-be wife. And we were every day walking by a Turkish little kiosk, or however you call it in English. I don't know the English word. Where a Turkish guy called Bayram Hassan would sell ice cream and juice. Now, that guy would scream as, oh man, and he had pistachio ice cream. I don't even care, it's not healthy. I can eat it until I die. I mean, it's good. Anyway, so, he would scream, today you pay, tomorrow is for free. <laughs> I believed him. I was stupid. <laughs> so I went to him, I paid two ice creams, one for my wife, my girlfriend in that time, one for me. And then I went next day, I said, hey, can we have our free ice cream? He said, what are you talking about? Today you pay. Tomorrow is for free. I said, yeah, but today is tomorrow. He said, son, listen to yourself. You said today is tomorrow. Today is today. Tomorrow is tomorrow. I said, yeah, but I came yesterday. Yeah, but that was not today. That was yesterday. <laughs> I said, you, you play with me. He said, no, you don't get it. Today you pay. He said, okay, so I paid again. Next day I came, I said, I am determined. I need my free ice cream. He said, son, today you pay. Tomorrow is for free. I said, but when is tomorrow? And he said, tomorrow never comes. Folks, that may be a good reason, but it's not 
the reason in this Bible verse. In fact, in Hebrew, it gives so clear the reason, and in English too. That's not the reason, actually. It's a good reason, but not good enough. It says, today, if you hear his voice, do not. So what happens if you don't do it today? You get crocodile skin. You follow me? If you hear today the message and you go to church and the Holy Spirit is moving your heart and he's asking you to change and you say, I got to do something about it and you go home and you are impressed and you say, tomorrow morning I'll start praying and you don't start praying today, by tomorrow that impression goes and tomorrow you are busy and you'll say next week and it's never going to happen and then when you hear again, you kind of, oh, I heard that before. And then when you hear again, it leaves you cold. And the more you procrastinate, the thicker your spiritual skin becomes. It's like when we sin. The more we sin, the more we get used with the sin to the point that we find excuses for the sin. It, it hardens our heart to the point that we get beyond the point of return. And does not make any sense for God to keep talking because we have no ears to listen. You follow me? There is no gain, folks. Today, if you hear, do not harden your hearts. Do not procrastinate. Because, you know, tomorrow is not going to have the same effect. When God speaks to you, you ought, you must act right away. I mean, if you hear it today, as soon as the sermon is done, don't start talking about what you cooked yesterday. As soon as the sermon is done, or you pray, the Holy Spirit will impress you, or you study the Word, the Holy Spirit will work in your heart. As soon as you are done, don't go to your business. Get in a room. Get to somebody, stop talking trivial things, doesn't matter. They that don't have to be bad things. And start praying, Lord, you touch my heart. Help me implement it starting now. Make a decision, ask God for help to implement the decision. You follow me? We have heard so many sermons. Why we don't act on them? This is the reason. This is the reason. Act right away. Paul says there is great danger in this type of religion when we hear it and do nothing about it, procrastinate and push it for tomorrow. We are good people. We don't break the Sabbath. We don't cheat on our spouse, some. We pay tight, some, hopefully. We eat broccoli and yet, I mean, we don't procrastinate when we have to do some business for ourselves. If you have to do something for your house or for your job, you get busy and do it. You have on a list and you finish it today. But when it's about spiritual things, we feel that we can procrastinate. That tells what are our priorities. You follow me? There is great danger in this type of religion. Why now? Because the heart will get hardened. And there will be no point for God to keep calling. Israel kept Sabbath better than we do. Israel paid tight in a very picky way, including from parsley and broccoli. And nevertheless, they were lost. They died in the wilderness. Would you agree with me? <clears throat> I've seen people in our churches that they come to church, they listen to the sermon, they love the Lord, they even sing in the choir, they do what is good, but they do nothing about acting on what the Holy Spirit moves them. And coming to church, folks, is not going to change the heart. Don't get me wrong, it's good. We should come to church. But it's not going to fix the problem. Therefore, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, God says, I hate your prayers. Wow. I hate your Sabbaths. I hate your assemblies. I hate your offerings. I do not listen to your prayers. Do you follow? Some leave the church and then they come back. They are moved and they get rebaptized. 
But again, they don't act on it like the water of baptism would soften their heart. It doesn't. It doesn't even soften the dirt on them because it's too short. You got to act on it, not be just listeners. So let's go back. What happened to Israel? Israel was God's people, wasn't it? We are God's people, aren't we? Well, let's see what happened to Israel. Why would Paul talk about Israel? Would he want to change them? They are dead. He wants to change us. So, what happened when we procrastinate? So, let's, let's move on. Hey, it worked. Paul is actually addressing God's spiritual Israel. You and me, the church of today. Yeah, let's move on. What happened? Four lessons, you remember? Number one, procrastinate versus urgency. Number two, called out of Egypt versus love for Egypt. Israel was called out of Egypt. What happened to them? So how long did they stay in Egypt? you remember? 430 years, good. If you said 40 years, that's wrong. That was in the wilderness. Okay, 430, I think you said. 430 years. After 430 years, God sent Moses to Pharaoh who said, let my people go. Why go? It says in the Bible, let them go to serve me. Why were they called? To serve God. They were not called to just go to the promised land. Yes, they were called to be saved, to give them the promised land. But until then, they were called to serve. Let's see what is the next slide. Too much okay so they were in bondage in egypt what is egypt is the symbol for sin bondage to sin bondage to work bondage to this world that's the symbol in the bible for egypt they were in bondage in egypt moses was sent to deliver them moses is the symbol in fact moses says in i believe deuteronomy chapter 18 i'm not sure i have it there moses said god is gonna send you somebody like me, talking about Jesus. Moses was sent to deliver them from Egypt and save them. Jesus was sent to deliver us from Egypt and save us. You follow, okay? So, what happened? In fact, in, in, the Bible says that we are all, in Hebrew, we are all in Egypt. But the greatest news is that Jesus came to save us from Egypt. And we can be set free by the blood of Jesus. Why were we called? <clears throat> Let's get to the point. Oh, this remote. <clears throat> what happened to Israel? They were called out of Egypt. Okay, finally. They were called out of Egypt, and they got to the Red Sea. What, you like my picture? What is Red Sea? Is the symbol in the Bible for? Baptism. The Bible says that we are all baptized into the sea. It says. Okay. So, I don't know if you have been baptized or not. <clears throat> if not, you should. But let me ask you. Is it enough to be baptized? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We, they were called from Egypt. They were baptized. And then, after that, listen. God led them in the wilderness. When you pray that God will deliver you, will God deliver you or not? What happens first? You need to love God or to obey God. When are you delivered and saved? When you obey God or not, what do you think? What came first? The Ten Commandments at Sinai or the deliverance from Egypt? Deliverance. God must pull you first out of Egypt and deliver you and save you. And then he can give you the Ten Commandments and ask you to obey. For some reason, our folks, while they say that, they feel that they need first to obey and then they can be delivered. But nobody can obey before they have been delivered. There is no way in the world that we can actually obey. We need to be delivered 
and then Jesus can say, if you love me, you obey me. After we are delivered and saved and filled with God's presence and love him, then he can start working on us. And by the way, church, as long as you pray asking God for help, he keeps working, saving and delivering you and changing you. It's not an event, it's a lifelong process. And it doesn't matter where you are in that process. You may be the thief on the cross, really low in your sanctification. And we are going to talk about that clearly today. You may be really a sinner, a full 100% sinner, never did anything good like the thief on the cross and still be saved. Or you may be like Paul at the end of the process and you say, hey, walk like me because I walk like Jesus. You may be at the end, you may be Mother Teresa, whatever, or Paul, or Abraham, or Moses. You may be at the end of the process in spiritual maturity and still be saved. It doesn't really matter where you are, here or here or here, as long as you are in Jesus. You follow me? So if you daily pray and ask for help, he daily keeps working in you, and you are in that process. And if Jesus comes today and you are praying that prayer, you are saved. So for some reason, we have the tendency to look to self. I am not good enough. Sure, we are not good enough. But who asked you to look to self? You need to fix your eyes upon Jesus. We know that. We just don't do it. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so <clears throat> they got to the Red Sea. They got baptized. They start coming to church. They start doing evangelism and going to camp meetings. And, and is that good enough? Listen. Some of them, the Bible says, that were still carrying Egypt with them through the wilderness. And the Bible says that as they were walking through the wilderness, they started to, he says right there, do not murmur as they did. They started to murmur about what? They murmured about three things. Let's see if we have it on the slide. They started to murmur about manna. We got enough of this heavenly bread. We want our McDonald's. It's a big deal, food for us. We make such a big deal. I tell you, my grandfather, he was, he was born in uh, 1896 or 97. 1890 some and he died 17 18 years 17 years ago a week before he came to america he lived around 103 or 104 103 and a half something like that years he was an old guy never sick in his life he ate always healthy fully vegetarian he walked every day about five six seven kilometers that's around four or five miles a day to the last day of his life and he went to both wars, First and Second World War. Both wars, he was taken prisoner, once by the Nazis, by the Germans, once by the Russians. Both of them condemned him to death. Both times he escaped. One time, he was in Siberia, prisoner, and a day before they wanted to execute him, he managed to escape. And he walked back from Siberia to Romania, and it took him six months of walking through the snow and ice and he told me stories like the wolves attacked him and he prayed and fought the wolves and i said grandpa what did you eat and he said son bark from the trees i said you are kidding me he said no no kidding you leaves and barks i said we are not goats and he looks to me he says son you love your food too much you don't live to eat you eat to live. You follow me? We make a big deal out of food. And we murmur and we come in. And they murmured about the water. They wanted soda. And they murmured about the leader. They even wanted to kill Moses with rocks. Oh, let's find ourselves another leader who would say what we say and who would do what we want. That's the way we want our pastors. And if they don't do that, we crucify them. We throw rocks on them. Who gave them Moses? God. In fact, God said to Moses, when they rebel against you, they don't rebel against you. They rebel against who? Against me. 
Did it ever occur to you that when you criticize your leaders, you actually rebel against God? Because God is in control. I was somewhere long ago. I'm not going to tell you the place. And I hate to tell you this story. And one of the church leaders, way high leader, started to persecute 17 pastors, including me. I was among the 17. What happened, basically, there were 21,000 missing from the church budget instantly. Last month, the 21,000, well, let me tell you something. In America, 21,000 may be nothing. But in Romania, where the pastor's salary was $64 a month, 21,000 was a big deal. You could have built a whole church in that time with 21,000. Well, 21,000 missing from my church account, 18,000 missing from the next district church account, 42,000 missing, I don't know how much, 17 churches had money missing in the bank. And my treasurer says, Pastor, do you know anything about it? Uh uh, no clue. I don't deal with money. He has the board. We don't. So I go to the conference. And I asked so-and-so. And he says, none of your business what happens to the money. You got to preach the word and do evangelism. Go away and don't ask again. I said, yes, it is our business. It's, our, it's church money. So I went back. I said, he doesn't talk to me. So my board got very upset. So my board went there and they said, hey, we need to know what happened. And he said, none of your business. So they went to the bank. And the bank said, so-and-so came and signed for it and took the money. And they checked, and it was the guy from there, from the conference office. So he called me, and he said, you sent them to the bank. You are going to pay for it. And he cut my salary for one year and a half that I lived as a pastor without a salary for a pastor. And in that time, he wanted to persecute me like every day. He would cut my mileage. He would cut this and that. He cut my insurance. And my wife said, Get out of ministry. We don't need it. I said, honey, he didn't call me to ministry. God called me to ministry. It has to be God to kick me out of ministry. I'm not here for a salary. We had a business. We had money, a bunch of money. If we want money, we go back to business. I'm here to serve. I'm going to do my job. I am called a servant. That's the way we are called, by the way. So what do servants do? Serve. I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to judge him. Would you, if you or me or the board members, judge him? Be honest. Do that. <laughs> oh, don't lie. Come on. Would you be tempted, if you are a good Christian, at least in your heart, to say, he's a stinker? Would you be tempted? <laughs> yes, I was tempted. In fact, I said to my wife, he should not be in ministry and in the conference office. But then... I said, Lord, forgive me. Because God is not in vacation and God is not asleep. Would you agree? And God is in control. And God loves this church more than you do. And if God allowed it, he must have a purpose. Because if God would say no, it would not happen, believe me. When God puts a limit, nobody goes over the limit. But sometimes God wants me and you to learn some lessons that would get us ready for other trials. And we, instead of learning the lessons, we start murmuring and looking somebody, for somebody to blame. And we have challenges and we have trials. And instead of learning the lesson, we try to fix the problem. And we forget that all things happen for a reason. You follow me? How many things happen for a reason? What means all? 98%? Oh, why do we forget that? So I said to my wife, Honey, I'm not going to get out of ministry and I'm not going to cry for that salary. God will provide. And he did. Do you think it was easy? Oh, I went to the conference office. How many did you baptize? 11. How many did you? 12. How many did you? I said, 44. He said, in front of everyone, you are a liar. I said, I give you the names. I don't care. Get out. Your salary is cut this month too. Oh, I got out and I got, excuse me, diarrhea and I got stomach pain and my stomach started to do that. When I get angry, my ears turn red. When my wife sees my ears red, she says, honey, come in the other room. We need to pray together. My ears turned red. That means I got angry. 
my blood started to go through the body like that. And I, I, when he said, I'm going to cut your salary again. So I run out and call my wife, honey, we need to pray. I'm, I'm getting angry. <laughs> we pray together. Then I calm down and I said, none of my business. God didn't call me to be the judge. God called me to be the servant. He is the judge and he cares. God called me to serve. So if God gave me pastor so-and-so, I'm going to let God judge him or change him. And instead of criticizing him, I'm going to pray for him and follow Matthew 18. You follow me? I don't know why we criticize our leaders. We are good in criticizing, not good in praying for or helping or working. When we built the church and it was against the law, we would build during the night in Romania. And we would not use any power tools. So the police would not see that we built the church because they would put us behind bars for the rest of our life. And there were people in the church that did not build, but they would say, that wall is not straight. That color doesn't look good. Lazy. Those who work don't criticize. The lazy ones criticize. The spirit of Satan to criticize and to judge is called in Greek ho antidikos. Satan is called ho antidikos. The criticizer of his brethren, the judger of his brethren. Who called you to have the spirit of Satan? Hello? Yeah, I know he's rough. So, they started to murmur against Moses. And they murmured. And they murmured. And they said, we need to find somebody else who does what we want and says what we want. So what happened to Israel? Instead of being delivered, they died in the wilderness. Folks, they forgot the ten plagues. Powerful. They forgot the Red Sea being split and walking through the sea from Florida to Cuba all the way. The other way around, sorry. From Cuba to America. <laughs> walking through the ocean or through the sea, they forgot the manna coming from heaven daily. They forgot the water coming from the rock. They forgot the, the pillar of fire and the cloud. You remember? Why do we forget what God does for us? And two, three days later, after God answers your prayer, we start murmuring again. Because we focus on problems instead of focusing on God. So, they murmured. Each time we choose to murmur against something, against somebody, against some trials or something that happens in our heart, each time we choose to murmur, something happens to our heart. Our heart gets harder and harder. And it affects your heart, and it affects your family, and it affects your church, and it affects your eternal salvation. God tried to reveal to them many times his plan to help them understand. But they chose to, 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 to focus on these things. Listen, folks, we too much focus on here and now instead of focusing on there and then. When we struggle, it's because we focus on this garbage that is going to burn, soon is going to burn if you believe in what you preach. We focus on these problems, we focus on these people, we need to have the, the big picture in mind. Jesus is coming soon. And we need to forget this garbage and focus on there. They lost focus. They lost focus of where they were going to, heaven, I mean, promised land. And they lost focus of their call to serve. You follow me? So I am asking you, do you lose focus? Every day, do you lose focus? Do you murmur? Do you complain? Look what I am going through, pastor. I'm not saying don't call your pastor. But hey, to complain doesn't help you. You fix your eyes on the problems. It would rather help you to fix your eyes on God. <clears throat> Each time they murmured, they departed another step from God, says the quotation. God was trying through all those trials, listen carefully now, Maybe I have the quotation. Let's see. Let's move another one. Oh, come on. We did say that, didn't we? 
I need another one. Oh, oh, too much. Okay. So, I don't have this quotation. I'm going to read it to you. God was trying through each trial to teach them love, patience, humbleness, self-denial, and trust in Him, not in self. The trials were supposed to grow them, to, to purify them, and get them ready for heaven. But they, instead of learning through the trials, they tried to fix the trials and they murmured. Did you hear? They opposed God's plan. Each time we murmur and we don't accept what happens to us and we don't learn, we harden our hearts. We are self-centered. Each time we murmur, we go farther and farther away from God. So, let's move on. Why did God set them free? Number one, to give them the promised land, eternal life. Number two, to make them a light, a kingdom of priests, so they would serve him and save others for God. Why did God call you? For two purposes. Number one, so you serve him. Number two, that he would give you eternal life, save you. Am I right? Okay, amen to that. So, what happened to Israel? They lost sight of the promised land and they lost sight of their call. I ask you today, have you lost sight of the two things? So Israel lost sight. The moment we lose focus of our call and of heaven, we start fighting among us for all kinds of things. Listen carefully. The moment you lose focus of your call and eternal life, heaven, you start fighting, murmuring, that's the reason churches have problems and politics and tension. You follow me? I hope you do. Salvation is a process. Now I'm going to give you the process of salvation. So, listen carefully. Listen carefully. They were saved out of Egypt. What is that? And in salvation terms... It is justification. And then they are led through the wilderness, and that's sanctification. And then they are given the promised land, and that's glorification. Let's repeat again. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Let's go through them a little. Salvation is, justification is salvation from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is salvation from the power of sin. Glorification is salvation from the presence of sin. Justification takes how long? One second. God, I mean, a moment, an event, maybe. Sanctification takes how long? A life. Glorification takes how long? An eternity. I don't know if you follow. Justification from deliverance from sin. Sanctification, the growing experience until we become more and more like Christ. Glorification, getting into the promised land. So, I'm asking you, are you saved? What should you answer? Yeah, that's not a clear answer. It may be good. So listen, this is the answer. This is an ongoing process. I've been saved, justified. I am being saved, I go through the sanctification, and I will be saved, I'll go to the glorification. It's an ongoing process. How do you know that? Listen carefully. He who has the Son has life. In Greek grammar, the, the verb has, that is repeated twice, actually more, have the Son, has three times. It's a present continuum tense in Greek. That means that you need to have Christ how long? All the time. Basically, as long as you have Christ, you are going through the salvation. You are saved. doesn't matter where you are. In the beginning, in the middle, at the end. When you don't have Christ, it doesn't matter if you are at the end, you are lost. You follow me? I hope you do. So... <clears throat> We did talk about that. When God delivered them, did He deliver them at Mount Sinai when He gave them the law? We did talk about that. He delivered them when He, de he got them out of Egypt. God must first pull you out of Egypt and then ask you to obey. 
Let's move on. <clears throat> Four lessons. The first, procrastinate versus urgency. Second, called out of Egypt versus love for Egypt. Number three, unbelief versus faith. We are not saved but what we do, by what we do, but by, by what he does. It is by faith. We know that, don't we? We talk about it, don't we? It's a bunch of baloney. We don't believe it. We don't leave it. How are you doing, brother? Oh, I am good. How are you doing, sister? Oh, I am good. I'm going to pray for you. Blah, 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 blah. It's a bunch of lies. We are not good. And we don't pray for them. And we don't care. And if we care, we struggle. And we don't know where we are. And we have no peace. And we struggle with trials every day. And we struggle with sin. And we struggle with salvation. And we, we don't know where we are. And we try hard to overcome, and we never manage. And the sin that we pray against and pray for victory is the sin that we repeat again and again and again. You follow me? Why? I'm going to talk about that a lot today in the afternoon. But let's see why. Listen, what happened? Moses got Israel to Kadesh Barna. You remember the name? When they got to Kadesh Barna, Moses took 12 spies, you remember the story? And sent them to check the land, you remember? The 12 spies went, they checked the land, and they came back, and they said, all 12, wow, the country is unbelievable. The grapes are like this, the tomatoes like this, and they didn't lie. You follow me? But then they said, 10 out of 12, there are giants, and we cannot overcome them. You remember? Were they right or wrong? They were right. They said they are giants. Were they giants? And they said, we cannot overcome them. Were they right? Absolutely. You and me cannot overcome the giants. When, when I was a kid, I used to have stupid fun. I would catch fleas from my dog. That was an outside dog. It was a big Romanian shepherd. Big, long hair, white. He was not clean white, he was like a pig, but anyway. And he had a bunch of fleas. And it doesn't matter, we, in that time we didn't have drops to put on them. We would give him a, a bat once in a while, hoping that he gets rid of the fleas, they never did. Anyway, I would catch fleas and put them in the tub where I would take my shower. But the tub is so tall, and the fleas are small. And the, I would watch the flea, ping! Ping, ping, trying to jump over the tab. But the flea could not jump more than this, and the tab was this. So the flea never managed to escape out of the tub. And I was watching the flea until the flea gave up and then died. And I said, they cannot escape. I remember later, I was in high school, and I went to my dad. I said, I struggle with this and that, and I pray, and I cannot overcome this sin. And my father said, yeah? and you'll never manage. I said, you're supposed to tell me how to do it. And my father said, there is no solution. There is nothing I can tell you. You'll never manage. And my father said to me, do you remember the fleas that you'd put in the tub? Yeah, that's who you are, trying to jump over the tub, but you cannot jump so high. I said, what do you suggest? And my father said, stop jumping. <laughs> I said, should I live in sin? That's what Christianity do. Some ignore sin, I mean, ignore, love sin, ignore God's call to obedience, and some try to obey in their power. That's what Christians do. And my father said, son, God didn't call you to fight sin. Yes, you, you should hate sin, but God called you to get Jesus. He is the one who fights sin and overcomes. You have a problem, son. You look to self instead of looking to Jesus. And you focus on self instead of focusing on Jesus. And you fight yourself instead of letting Jesus fight. He said, you really didn't get what is Christianity about. It's about Jesus. It's not about you. You follow me? I hope you do. Basically, none of them lost the promised land because they didn't come the giants because they didn't overcome sin, because they are not good enough. They lost the promised land, the Bible says in Hebrew, because of unbelief. We don't know our God, and we don't trust our God. We talk about it. Oh, how I trust Jesus. A bunch of baloney. 
we don't know our God and we don't trust our God. We trust self and after we get discouraged, then we become Pharisees and live a double life. And we pretend to be who we are not. Unbelief. Do you really believe that he who called you out of Egypt has the power to save you? And he has the means. And he has the will. He desires to save you. And he will finish what he started. Do you believe that he will be able to deliver? Then don't fix your eyes on self. The ten spies that came back said, we cannot do it. The other two said, hey, do you remember what he has done for us 20 years ago when we got baptized or whatever? Do you remember what he has done for us when we lost our job and we had cancer? Do you remember what he has done for us? Do you remember this and that and that? He is able and he loves us and he is my God and I trust him and he will do it again. And I choose not to look to the problems, but I choose to look to Jesus. So let's go there and get the country. Faith is not based on what you do, who you are, what you know, if you keep Sabbath or not. Well, you should keep Sabbath. Faith is based in having a relationship with Jesus good enough to the point that you get to know him and to trust him and have peace when you get in front of the giants. Have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Abraham believed and it was considered to him as righteousness. What does he mean? What does he mean? It's very simple. It says in Hebrew, when Abraham believed, God considered him as righteous as God himself. Wow! When you believe, God considers you righteous. So, let's move on quick so we finish. Listen carefully. Hold on a second. Give me a few more seconds. Listen carefully here. I talked to somebody, to a guide, when I went to Israel. Give me just a few seconds. I talked to somebody. You know how long it takes from Kades Barna to Jericho to walk? You know how long? 11 days if you walk. And if you have elderly and, and cows and animals with you, it takes about 14 days. How long did it take them to walk? from that spot to that spot. Forty years I wrestled with that. I have a problem with that. We should have been in heaven long ago. Why do we go around in the wilderness? Why do we go around in the wilderness? Because of unbelief. Listen carefully what he says there. Listen carefully. Let's get there. Let's finish. God did not design that his people should have wandered 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them how? Directly, quickly, 11 days to the Canaan and establish them there how? Holy, healthy, and happy. But those whom it was preached, they were not in because they didn't overcome the giants, because they were weak. Because they didn't have enough knowledge, because they didn't keep Sabbath, and they didn't do evangelism. Why? Listen, folks, that's our problem. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, hatred, criticism, and so on. And God could not fulfill the covenant. For 40 years, unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut the ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. Listen carefully now. The same sins have delayed who? Who is that? It's me and you. The same sins have delayed the modern Israel from entering into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promise of God at fault. It is unbelief and consecration, worldliness, strife, and so on. Wow! Wow! It was easy for God to pull Israel out of Egypt. But it was difficult to put Egypt out of Israel. Hello? Are you with me? Are you still following? How, how many of them left Egypt? 600,000 men plus wives plus children, close to 2 million. How many of them entered Canaan? Hello? How many of them are in the Campion Church or everybody who is here? How many will enter Canaan? 
I don't know. You people, you don't have those problems. You will all enter in heaven. But there, only two. Why? Because they had problems? Because they were weak? Because they didn't have training? Or because of unbelief? What does the Bible say? Do you believe that God has the power to pull you out of Egypt? Do you believe that God has the power to get you into the promised land? Do you believe that God is able? Then you don't need to understand how. You follow me? To understand how, it means you are as smart as God. You don't need to understand how. You just need to trust Him. You follow me? You need to choose to believe and say, I don't care how and I don't care who I am. I care to love Him and to have Him and to trust Him and to be all about Him and I'm going to die for Him because I love Him and that's what I want. Okay, let's finish. It says there, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want to make a point. We'll finish in a few seconds. And if, if I am too long, don't call me back. I don't care. <laughs> behold the Lamb of God is not a statement. Oh, behold the Lamb of God. In Greek, it's a command. It's an imperative. Basically, it says, this is what you need to do. In order for your sins to be taken away, you need to behold. In Greek, that's a command. How are you saved? You are saved by beholding. You follow me? Paul says that we are changed from glory to glory into his image by looking like in a mirror, by beholding. It's not when we fight. It's going to get you discouraged. It's when you fix your eyes on Jesus. Not on problems, not on sin, not on self, but on Jesus. That's when you... Okay. You can read that yourself. I'm going to finish now. Now you can start. So, there was a story that was real a few years ago. Listen, folks. If you are serious about salvation, you need to start. We need to start examining our hearts today. And we need to start trusting our God. Because if not, it doesn't matter that you come to church and go to camp meeting and eat broccoli. We'll not enter the promised land. We need to get to know and to trust and to love our God. And that should not happen tomorrow. This is our problem. And I tell you what, God can do it. But if we are serious, we need to pray, Lord, have mercy on me and stop looking to the others. And daily say, Lord, I want you today to lead me. I want you today to fill me. And you don't need to understand how he will do it. You just need to keep praying that prayer. And as long as you keep praying it, he will keep working on you. And it's none of your business how, but he will save you. And you need to believe, not based on what you feel. I feel something in me, I am saved. You need to believe based on his word, on who he is. Okay? So... <clears throat> Christianity is not about you trying. It's about you trusting. Yeah, we have issues with, in our society with trust. We don't trust anybody. We don't trust self. It's time to start trusting God. So, let me, let me finish with a story. Oh, by the way, by the way, God wanted them to learn the link. Not just, there were three things. There is, why wilderness? That was the fourth lesson. Why wilderness? Carefully, listen, quick, because I am late. Number one, why wilderness? Why would God allow trials? Number one, to teach them to let go of Egypt. We need to let go of Egypt. Number two, carefully, to teach them to be a light and save others, to serve. We need to start caring for others and be a light and save people around. We are too self-centered, too concerned with me, 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 and we forget that God has many others. And as we save others, we grow ourselves. You follow me? But number three, God wanted them to start getting ready for heaven because you will not enjoy heaven if you don't match heaven. 
you need to live the way you live in heaven in order to be happy to live in heaven. You follow me? You need to speak the language of heaven to behave the behavior of heaven in order to go to heaven. And you are not going to change when Jesus comes. We need to start changing now. And what is the language, the behavior of heaven? It's the fruits of the Spirit. Love, not stubbornness, but kindness, humbleness, patience. We don't have those things. And we try hard to produce the fruits of the Spirit, and we forget that it's the fruits of the Spirit. It's not the fruits of you. Therefore, you need the Spirit to produce the fruits of the Spirit. So instead of trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit, better pray to be filled with the Spirit. You follow me? That's the reason God allowed wilderness in your life. To let go of Egypt, to save others, to be a light, and to start living like in heaven. Wouldn't that be something if our church would leave the fruits of the Spirit, would be filled with the Spirit, live here like in heaven? Wouldn't that be something? Well, folks, the story says, and that's the way we finish, that at Olympics a few years ago, there was a runner, and this is a real story, who came from Africa to represent his country. And he, for the last three, four years, he used to win the running competition. He would always come number one. He would always come number one. But this time, it was in front of the cameras, television, the whole world was watching. He was running, and he was number one. And as he was running, a muscle snapped and broke and he fell in terrible pain and as he fell down the other runners one by one passed him and he tried hard to do it himself and he pulled himself with all his power and he got up and he tried again and the pain was so great that he fell again and he got up again and tried again to overcome and the pain was greater than his strength, and he fell again. And there, in the audience, there was his father watching him. And his father could not stand to see him suffering that way and trying and never managing. And his father got between the guards and ran straight to him and said, Son, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to finish. Son, you cannot win. He says, I know, I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to finish. I want to finish this race. I want to finish. My country, my, my king, they sent me to finish. I want to finish. And the father said, but you cannot do it. Don't you get it? He said, yes, but if you help me, we can do it. So the father said, well, son, I will help you because I love you. So the father took him like this, and the son took him like this, and together they limped over the crossing line. And the reporters came and said, why did you do that? He said, well, my country sent me to finish, and I'm going to finish at any price. How did you manage? He said, well, I would have never finished the race if it was not for my father. But my father came, and he walked with me. And that's the way I finished the race. Folks, do you get the message? Do you understand what is happening to the church? Many are called out of Egypt. But not too many will enter because they don't understand what it means to fully trust our God. And they focus too much on self and on this garbage instead of focusing on God and getting to know Him and getting to love Him and getting to trust Him. And God is calling the church finally today to trust Him because by faith we'll be saved. And it's not enough to say it. But we got to act on it. May the Lord help you and me to live that.